Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for watching the KC Auction video blog today. I'm Jason Roski, the host of the owner of the KC Auction and Appraisal Company. And I'm really excited to have Gwen Hefner, the Make Arista, with us today. Gwen, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm good. How are you, Jason? I'm doing really, really well. It's uh, interesting to see you live on a video as opposed to live in person. Right. In our office, right? You come, you come downtown to see us many, many times over the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, real quick, for those who don't know who Gwen is, which I find hard to believe since she has 87,000 followers on Instagram and 5,000 followers on Facebook, and she's on Twitter and all over the place as a blog. She has over 100,000 people follow her in different locations. She's a lifestyle design blogger, uh, Instagrammer, influencer, a uh, real cool woman who uh, we've been fortunate enough to know here in K at the Casey Auction Company for a couple of years. She started... I'm not sure exactly when you started, but I know you got married to your husband in 2008. Uh, you, I started, you actually, I, uh, I started yeah. blogging, I think, 2013. 2013. Yeah. Wow, you had early success because in 2015, you got uh, decorated blog of the year by Better Homes and Gardens. I thought that was pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I definitely, I think my PR and marketing background helped kind of push me it was a big help in getting my blog out there from the very beginning. And I just had some things align really great where I met um, some of the editors at Better Homes and Gardens pretty early and they were really supportive of my work, which was awesome. And yeah, so. So why don't you tell us, uh, you know, I know you studied opera at Marist College. You t uh, did study fashion at New York University. Uh, I studied opera at Simpson and then oh, I, Simpson. yeah. And then I did fashion at Marist, which is okay. in New York, but it was through a program called the New York fashion experience in New York city. So how did you go from that to becoming the maker Rista, a modern traditionalist who isn't afraid of color? Yeah. So from a young age, I've always been really into creating and making and so yeah, I started singing when I was about three years old. I played a lot of instruments. Um, in college, I studied opera and I also at the same time had a jewelry business. Um, I interned for a jewelry metalsmith and I also in college interned at a fashion boutique. And uh, I was pursuing music, was planning to go to grad school for vocal performance. And one day I woke up and I realized that my roommate, who now sings at the Met, sings all over the world, Sarah Larson, amazing, incredibly talented singer. Every morning she would wake up and get on operanews.com and I would wake up and get on style.com. <laughs> and it, it was kind of an awakening. And my teacher at the time, when I was kind of contemplating what my next step was, she said, Gwen, if you don't wake up every day, thinking only about music and go to sleep every night, only thinking about music, then this might not be the path for you. And I'd interned over the summer for the Des Moines Metro Opera. I did that several summers and I just saw what it took and how long it took to be, to really um, come into your own as an opera singer. The maturity level is pretty late in life. And yeah. so, yeah, I just made this kind of, crazy decision that wasn't necessarily my personality. I called my parents and I said, I, I don't think I want to do music anymore. I want to move to New York. I found this program and I want to do fashion. And so I did that right before I moved to New York. I met Micah while I was here at home. It was one of those things where I actually was, I was like, I don't have, I'm moving to New York. I'm not going to go on a date with you. And anyways, he was very persistent. And so we started dating. We dated while I was in New York and I wasn't there very long when he wanted me to move back. And I said, well, I'm not moving back for a boyfriend. So he proposed to me after six months of dating most of that long term. And we've wow. been married for almost 12 years now. Um, and when it was really, when I became a stay at home mom, I started reading blogs. Um, and I related to the women and I really enjoyed it. But I also realized I was doing a lot of what they were doing. And I actually started my blog as a um, 
more of an entertaining and crafting vlog. At the time, I was making a lot of clothes for my daughter and throwing a lot of parties. And the first blog post I had was my daughter's first birthday. And I took a picture of a dress I made her in her room. And people were like, we want to see your house. And so, so it's kind of been this weird evolution. Um, but like I say, I think I always go back to I love to create. I love to find the beauty in everything. And so I think that's a big thing for me, why I love secondhand and why I love thrifting, because I love to find that diamond in the rough. And I love to be able to see beauty anywhere, even in a junk shop. So, yeah, you know, talking about you making your daughter's dress, you know, your, your original tagline was I'm making anything and everything except dinner. Yeah. Uh, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> you didn't, like, you didn't of- take dinner, but she had parties, so you had to have food around. So you just ordered in or catered, but. Um, yeah, I have a very talented sister-in-law who makes wonderful food, and so it kind of works out. <laughs> is, is that the same sister-in-law who uh, hunts our auctions now? <laughs> that it would be her, yes. That would that be her. Awesome, awesome. She's like, when every – well, she actually doesn't like when I come to you because she says the prices are higher than <laughs> as good of deals on things. Yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. So how did you go from – because we talked about the different things you've done, you know, Twitter – you have a blog, you have a YouTube channel, but you have gravitated towards Instagram. Like Instagram, you're on seemingly every day and many times a day. And yeah. you, the other platforms have kind of fallen uh, fallen aside for you. Uh, yeah. what, what has driven you to, make, to Instagram? And for those watching, go ahead and post comments below or questions, we'll be happy to answer them. I'm going to answer them as you can. Yeah, I mean, for me, Instagram just very early on became the correct avenue for what I wanted to share. Um, again, it goes back when I started the blog, I knew I, my biggest thing was I want to have beautiful images. And mm-hmm. that's something I've always been really, um, really strived for. And so Instagram seemed like the natural fit. And then for me, when they started having stories at the time, I had started sharing more personal things on Snapchat. And then when Instagram did stories, I was like, okay, I'm all in here because it allows me to have those big, beautiful moments, those pulled back interiors in the feed, but it allows me to connect with my following and also just share more of who I am and my personal self um, in the stories. And then I've also started my private thrifting page where that's really allowed me to, um, share all of my thrifting and just um, that whole journey, which isn't always, you know, when you're in a thrift store, it's not as beautiful as what most people or what was perceived to be what people wanted to see on Instagram, specifically in the feed. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I always say my number one job is stay at home mom. I'm a mom of three and I have, don't have very much help with them outside of, um, you know, myself. And so I just can't, I'm, I'm a one woman show and I can't manage that many accounts by myself. So I think it's really important if you are somebody who's started a business and you're wanting to grow your social media, like focus on one or two things and right. do it really well. And I think that in the long run, that that's better for your brand than to kind of spread yourself so thin that you can't really give what you need to to each platform. Yeah, we definitely, I see that because I do all the social for us as of now, we're bringing somebody out to help us with that, but we focus more on Facebook because that's where we're, that's where we started. It just fit us really well from the get. Um, and Instagram is a great tool. We use it a lot, but we definitely notice, or I notice when I start to look at Twitter or other platforms, I start to lose what kind of got our business to where I, where, I, where it was and the recognition and the engagement that I want to have, even sure. though it, you know, so it's definitely a great great point for those who are watching who ever are in the business. You mentioned your kids, Domino, Xander, and Millie. Um, yeah. I think it's an important thing. You know, a lot of people, a lot of older generation folks think that there's nobody young collecting and buying antiques and decorative mm-hmm. objects. Obviously, that is not the case. I know that. You know, you, you know, I've talked about this. But aside from that, how do you collect? How do you decorate with having young children? Because your oldest is what? He, he'll be 11 and my youngest is three. Yeah, so, so yeah. 
Yeah, and this is something a lot of people ask me too. Like they see images of my home and <clears throat> they think, or they say to me, I could never have you know that kind of stuff out with my kids. I think there's a few factors. Number one, the things have always been there. So my right. kids from a very early age, I will say when they're in that like early toddler, just learning to crawl and walk, it does make it a little more work than if you don't have anything because you are having to monitor them and say, no, don't touch that. Or, um, but I feel like the reward is wonderful for me mm -hmm. to have those things brings me so much joy in my home. And as a stay at home, I'm in here all the time. So it's so important for me to love my home. And I think that, yeah, they just learn what they can touch, what they shouldn't be touching. But also from my perspective, most of the things on their level when they're younger, when they are that toddler age, it's not something that could hurt them. It's most likely from me, it's most likely something I got at Red Racks for a dollar, you know? So if it breaks, that's okay. Right. If I have something that's really meaningful or was a lot of money, I don't have it on a coffee table where they can reach it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. <laughs> And I say, I say this also saying that my kids probably every other day I'm having to tell them, get off the couch. You only sit on the couch. This is not a jungle gym. <laughs> like, they are not just like prim and proper children. And anybody who knows them will attest to that. But yeah, right? if your sofa, if your sofa was $35 at a thrift store and something happens to it, okay. You know, it's like, it's annoying, but it's it's not heartbreaking. So. <laughs> so you talk about thrifting and finding deals a lot, and you have thrifting with the Makerista and thrift like the Makerista, I think, on Instagram. With you tell, yeah, yeah. Tell, tell us about that and, and what prompted you to create a separate channel. Okay. Because uh, you know, one channel wasn't enough. Yeah. Well, so I started thrifting on Instagram stories pretty quickly after it story became a thing. Um, I'd been thrifting quite, so I started thrifting clothes and jewelry in high school. And for me in high school and college, even that was like just an escape for me and something I love to do. Once I became married and had a home and became a stay at home mom, and we went to like a single income family, I started thrifting things for my home because we were on a tight budget. And um, I really loved doing that. <laughs> but once story started is when I really was able to share the journey of thrifting with people and people just loved it. Mm -hmm. And a year ago in May is when I launched thrift with the Makerista, which is a private thrifting club. Basically it's, it's $20 a year. Um, but through that, you have access to all my thrifting journeys, whether it's here locally in town or whether I'm traveling. I mean, I'll do like a day trip to a different city or if we go, you know, I'll, we went to Ohio and I thrifted on the way there and there and on the way back. Um, it's also it's support. I have people over there asking me, you know, my grandma just passed away and I want to sell this piece what would you list it for? Or where would you list it? Or I found this dresser on Facebook marketplace. Do you think it's a good deal? What do you think about the piece? It's a place for people to ask me questions. And then we also have community questions. There are some really, really knowledgeable people in the group, people who know way more than I do. Uh, mm. Specifically, even just yesterday, I found some um, really great China. And there's a girl in that group who just knows everything about ceramics and pottery in China. Um, and so it's just, it's been really amazing to see this community form of people who love to thrift, people who want to know how to thrift. And it's just, um, yeah, I really love it and I'm so passionate about it. Um, it's, it's been a great experience and continues to grow. Um, Every day we're getting more and more members. So that's awesome. And yeah. there's, for some people, there is a stigma to thrifting, right? Buying something used Absolutely. from a thrift. And, and thrifting is literally buying things from a thrift store. I mean, that's the term that I always use for it. I've seen, I kind of use it. I use it very broadly. Like I would, yeah. For I've, me, and I've seen that. I was going to ask you about that. I've, I've seen just recently people saying, I thrifted that at an antique store. Uh, right. I, 
I thrift yeah. around the estate sale. So thrifting is becoming more of a generic term that's growing beyond its original usage. Um, yeah. But that kind of lessens the stigma. Do you have a lot of people come to you and say, how do you buy what you're living with a Sophie you bought at the thrift store? How do you do that? Absolutely. Um, and and that's another thing, like in the thrift club, I've I've talked about how I clean pieces, specifically upholstered pieces, how to look for bed bugs. Um, you know, these are real conversations. I think things like bed bugs are few and far between, but it is yeah. something you should look for and you should know how to look for it. And it's not hard. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something that was a stick has been a stigma and still is for a lot of people, I'm sure. Um, but I think understanding, I don't know, I always equate it to like when people say, oh, you'd buy linens from somebody else. And I'm like, well, you use a napkin at a restaurant, don't you? And, and the linens you buy at a thrift store, you're cleaning yourself so you know they're clean. But when you're mm -hmm. eating off that fork at a restaurant, you're hoping it's clean, you know? Um, so I think there's, you know, there's some perspective in that and understanding that, um, for me, it's a matter of you, you can get such amazing quality for so much less money. And, yes. and and you can create a home that is unique to you. And um, yeah, I just, there's so many benefits to it. Environmental, there's benefits. Um, yeah, financially, just, I, I barely buy anything new anymore. <laughs> I mean, I bought yeah, yeah. for $10. <laughs> A few months ago, and I tie dyed it myself. But <laughs> um, yeah, it is a huge, huge budget boost. Um, you know, we we've been thrifting and buying at auction and estate sales our entire married career. My wife and I've been married uh, coming up on twenty six years now, and it's still the same. Wow. There's some things, there's some things we buy new because we have allergies in our house and, and upholstered sure. furniture. You really, you do have a chance, uh, a larger risk of cats or dogs or, or pets. But by and large, we, we didn't always do that. We're now able to buy a new sofa when we want to. But um, you also give tips on your, your thrifting page too, don't you? And there's some, some things that you've talked about. I've heard you talk about in different places that I have never thought about. And I've been in this business a long time, longer than you wow. have. Well, thank um, you. That's a compliment. And, have, and, right. and there's things I've learned. Can you give our, our, our viewers one or two tips that, you know, especially on the Facebook marketplace, you have some like search things oh, that you do. Man. That's a huge, and that's been a huge thing, especially as of late. I mean, when you, if you know anything about social media and branding and business, you know about algorithms and mm -hmm. they're a real thing that can help your business. And it's a real thing that can help you on Facebook marketplace. There are certain things you can do in Facebook marketplace clicking on certain things, searching certain words that will help Facebook know what you want to see and show you more of it. That's one of the biggest things that I've heard back from people time and time again about the thrift club is that they were able to get their Facebook marketplace from basically being Nebraska Furniture Mart and like old hand-me-down, you know, not good quality things to seeing all of these antiques at great deals. And yeah, I mean, I like I said, I talk about that a lot in the club, but Facebook Marketplace is really where it's at if you're online thrifting right now. Um, there's just so much going on on there, so many great pieces, and it's a wonderful place to snag a great deal for sure. It's kind of like Craigslist was probably 15 years ago. Absolutely, yeah, it, it, it really is. And the, that's the funny thing too, is people will ask me like, well, don't you still search Craigslist or don't you offer up as another great app? Um, but the majority of people that are putting things on those apps are putting it on Facebook as well. So it's right. like, you know, here and there, you'll find something that you're not seeing on Facebook marketplace on Craigslist, for instance, but it's very, very rare. So yeah. they, they were smart in creating, in creating that part of, Facebook for sure. Yeah, and it's interesting how oftentimes we get calls to sell something from somebody and we'll do, we always research things and oftentimes the people have tried to sell it on Facebook marketplace. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. And they're always the ones that are priced higher than realistic I, numbers, right? So that's, yeah. you gotta go through a lot of that. But I've seen I, some of the deals you've talked about 
Yeah. Uh, and I know it could be a great, great gold mine. You, um, your main canvas for your stories and everything you do is your house. Yes. You know, beautiful 1980s colonial out in the suburbs here in Kansas City. And most people wouldn't think of using a house of that age, housing such an eclectic mix and bold colors and splashes of personality. Um, and you've been renovating this house since, you know. 2015, I think. I think yeah, it's, yeah. Been, it's been five, like almost five and a half years. So. so in some of these projects you did right away, are there things that you did five years ago that you look back on and say, I can't believe I did that or do you still love it? Or have you redone no. anything yet? I, redo? There, I am the type of person who thinks things through obsessively and overthinks things and puts way too much energy into them. But I always like them for a really long time. I think yeah. that, you know, coming out the other end, it's like, okay, that was worth it. I really, there's not a whole lot. There's some rooms like our entryway that we just kind of like painted and didn't put as much into it as some of the other spaces that eventually I would like to do a bit more to. Right. Um, but the rooms that we really tackled and really gutted and did a full, no, I'm totally happy with them. And it's funny how, you know, you move into a home and right away you see the eyesores and you're like, okay, we have to fix this. The rest of this is fine. And then as you kind of go and you make things your own, those things that you thought were fine are like, okay, this is not good. You know? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, like we've done a lot to our house, but our master bathroom is, whew, that's a, a doozy. And we, thought we, were, we were with families oftentimes in estate situations where they have moms or grandma's home. And like, well, we're thinking about taking out the carpets and revealing the hardwoods. I said, you realize that leads to an entire home renovation process <laughs> because you can't do one part of it because everything else looks so much worse. It's true. Yeah. I mean, I think any home there, you have that domino effect. Um, right. we, I talk about that all that time, all the time. Um, and yeah, it's just very hard to only do one small thing. So, so your work has led you to some pretty impressive uh, partnerships over the years. Chris loves Julia, Craftmade, even Lowe's Home Improvement. How is it working with these big international companies and, and how did that evolve? I know you just went to Arizona to work on a project with Lowe's and Chris loves Julia, who's another uh, Instagram yeah. sensation. Um, how yeah. did that evolve? What, what, and, and what's it like working with a big, big company like that? Um, well, I actually, Lowe's, I started working with them, man, it's probably been four or five years ago. And it was just another lovely blogger, Emily A. Clark. She recommended me to them or recommended yeah, me to them. And um, I went to High Point with them and kind of helped them do some buying, which was an amazing experience. Um, and from there, while I was there, I just mentioned our kitchen and I said, you know, we really want to have a partner for this project and it, it just all worked out. And they are just somebody I'm really, I not only love the brand, I love the people that I work with at the brand. And I just feel like that's been an interesting part. I, I've made so many wonderful friends through the Makerista people who follow me, but I've made some incredible friends working with brands and mm -hmm. um, Lowe's is just somebody who's always like really trusted my vision. And I think that's huge and so important and just makes for a wonderful partnership when you're working with a brand who trusts you and trusts you with their brand because you know, sometimes brands, they want to put words in your mouth and they want you to use specific things and it makes it kind of tricky. And authenticity for me has always been at the forefront. I always want to be authentic in who I am and in what I'm sharing. And so I tend to work with people who feel the same way. And so Julia, Chris loves Julia has been a dear online friend for a long time. And been a, I mean, she's you know, she's incredibly successful, incredibly talented, and and probably one of the smartest business women I know. And somehow it just came about where somebody uh, said that they wanted to see them work with me. 
And then Lowe's got word of that. And so they pitched us the idea to do a makeover together. And that was such an incredible experience. Giving back in that way to a family is just another um, facet of me that I want to do more of. Like I just love helping other people um, turn their homes into something that they can feel wonderful in, especially if they've been through something really rough. And so, yeah, that whole experience was awesome. Very cool, very cool. Uh, just a couple more questions before we wrap it up. What, who or what inspires you? Uh, you know, obviously you're inspiring to hundreds of thousands of people. Um, what inspires you now? Or what do you look forward for inspiration uh, when, you, when you're scrolling through Instagram uh, or whatever sources? That's are. a really good question. I mean, I feel like I can get, like I said, and I think it's part of having that thrifting eye. I feel like I can be inspired at Walmart. Like <laughs> there can be something I can see anywhere that can inspire me, whether I'm out in the woods behind our house or whether I'm, you know, like I said, I could be at a base, my son's baseball game and see something that would inspire me randomly. Uh, as far as Instagram, I, I would have to definitely say that Jamie Beck has been a huge inspiration in these last few years. Um, and just really, yeah, Jenny Commenda is my like OG. She is the person who I feel like helped me figure out how to put my style into my home. And, and she's, she's another one. She lives in Arizona. And when we were there to do the makeover, I finally got to meet her in person and it was everything I thought it would be and more. <laughs> she's just a, a total gem. And so she's somebody that I've always just consistently admired and looked up to, but Jamie Beck, if you don't follow her on Instagram, you're missing out on the beautiful simplicity that life has to offer. That's what I would, that's what I would. Is her, uh, hash, is her uh, username Jamie Beck or is it? It is Jamie, yep, yeah, at Jamie Beck. And I'm definitely gonna look that up. Yeah. I think I know, I think I follow Jenny Commenda. Yeah. Because I think I saw it when you were in Arizona and I think you've you've taken each other in different things over the years, so. Yeah, yeah. It's, Jamie it's Beck is just like next level. She lives in Provence. She was in New York City. Um, she actually, it's a really beautiful story because her and her husband, they were kind of going through some things, potentially getting a divorce and she moved to Provence to like, just live this artist life. I mean, she's someone, she's a photographer who shot for Netflix and I mean, huge brand. Um, and she moved to Provence on a whim. They ended up like getting back together and they have a baby now and they just live this beautiful life um i mean you know just her eye is incredible and she's an in incredible artist so yeah i very very cool i'll have to definitely very, look her up and see what she's all yeah. about sounds, sounds yeah. wonderful so glad we've talked about a lot of different things today before we go was there what did we not touch on or talk about that, ins that either inspires you or you want to leave a message to people who are watching this video uh, give you a couple minutes to tell it, say anything and everything you want to, uh, within reason, within reason. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, oh, I feel like we covered a lot. Um, I mean, obviously the, the thrifting piece is huge for me right now, but it's, it really is just a reflection of who I, who I am. And for me, it's, it's all about like creating beauty and, um, whether that's in your home, whether, I mean, I've gotten really into gardening over the last few years. And for me, that's all about that simplistic beauty that I've, that I've been inspired by Jamie Beck um, through. And yeah, I don't know. I, I'm hopeful that through the Makerista, I'm in, inspiring and encouraging others to find their own beauty, whatever that is. For me, that's color and traditionalism and a little bit of like, over the top glam. And um, I just hope that I can inspire other people to kind of find what that is for themselves. So. I, was, I was gonna ask you what you, what you, my last question was going to be, what do you hope your brand and your channel does for other people? And I think mm -hmm. it's kind of summed it up perfectly, just hoping to allow them to give, find their own voice in and amongst 
all the other. Yeah, and I think I think it's kind of a you know, again, just going back to that authenticity. I think that we've kind of come into this place where I I really don't like this word, but influencers. It's a lot of like pushing. This is what I have. So here's a swipe up for you to buy it, you know, mm -hmm. and that's not to say I never do a swipe up and I never incur, you know, I never share a product that people can buy. Um, but I really hope at the end of the day, what I'm sharing inspires people to find their own things that they love more so than buying the exact table that I have and the exact, you know, putting together the exact room that I have. Right. Um, that's always my goal is to allow people, help people find what makes them feel happy and fulfilled, not recreate what I have done for myself. So. Well, Gwen, thank you so much. We're going to wrap up the video here. And I want to thank everybody for watching today. This has been a wonderful show with uh, Gwen. You know, we do this every Friday. Next week, our guest is Trisha Brower, a benefit auctioneer here in Kansas City. It has an incredible history and, and story and business. We're talking about benefit auctions uh, in normal times and, of course, during the pandemic. Uh, we hope that you, if you enjoy this, please hit, hit our website, kcauctioncompany.com, to see what we do in our business. If you have any questions, you can always drop us an email at info at kcauctioncompany.com or give us a phone call at 816-283-3633 if you have any questions you'd like us to answer. Or questions about today's show, go ahead and post them below here, and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Again, Gwen, thank you so much for watching us today, or joining us today. Yeah, uh, we'll forward to watching on Instagram, and uh, have a great weekend. Yeah, hope I see you in person soon. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Liv.